uh, a fun, actually a newer segment on the show that um, we've been doing. Um, we have overrated, underrated. We have start, sub, sit, but we have this new segment called over or under. And so, you know, what we'll do is we'll give you a basketball topic and give you a number and then you tell if it's if it's over or under and we can have kind of a fun little discussion from there so to start uh we'll just give a fun one for you here to start but you are someone that you know when watching you coach you're very energetic on the sidelines you're up and down uh, a lot of movement so if someone had a step counter on the number of steps that you take during a game as a head coach over or under two and a half thousand steps that you take during a game 2500 steps as a head coach i would need to know, what is the calorie count on that you think <laughs> well, we we try to do the math and it's about yeah. two and a half thousand steps is about a mile walking about a mile so i don't well, know what the calorie so i i would be over that okay <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> uh, and, so but as tom, as tom crean is 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 he paces more than me though for sure <laughs> okay so we'll have to get him on and we'll up we'll up his uh to see where he's yeah. at <laughs> coach for kind of a a follow-up to that though um because obviously you're an energetic coach on the side um but what are you most concerned about during the game what are you like looking at mostly is it the flow of the game is it how hard your players are playing are you looking offense like what what do you zero in on personally as a head coach on the sideline everything okay um, <laughs> <laughs> i think number one is is certainly uh the intensity level that everybody has um, that's that's number one because it's a non-negotiable here if you're not playing hard it, it, you're not you're not going to be on the court um, it's non-negotiable from a defensive intensity and defensive game plan. Um, and then it's non-negotiable if you're being selfish, you know, um, if someone's rolling offensively, we'll call his play or his number time after time, after time, after time and milk that thing. Um, but we just don't want ill-advised shots. So I, it's pretty simple from a substitution pattern for us. Um, our guys could basically just walk off the floor because they'll know when, when they're probably going to come out. Uh -huh. um, so I, you know, and I know, but like, it's my job as the head coach to, you know, we're not a football team. Um, it's interesting though. I used to call out every offensive play throughout my whole career. Then when I got to Nevada, um, I actually had some other people and I would, we would converse or I would say, as, as, as we were going back on defense, I would say, hey, let's run, you know, 15 fist out red snake next time down the floor. And then somebody would write it on the board and we'd hold it up. Um, and, and so uh, I would say that, yeah, during the game, as a head coach, you've got to see and have a feel for everything. Because every time there's a timeout, it's your responsibility to make some adjustment or give some some nugget to help your team better position itself for the next four minutes. And if you're not doing that, then you failed as a coach. So it's my responsibility every single time out, which is whatever, every four minutes, like you've got to know what you're telling them offensively, defensively. You've got to tell them what the other team's doing. You got to tell them what the other team's adjustments are and how you're going to attack um, both offensively, defensively. And it all also might be, you know, you might have to change something up drastically. When you get behind in a game like we did against Cincinnati and we're behind 27 points or whatever in an NCAA tournament game and there's 10 and a half minutes to go, you know, if you go in the huddle and just say, hey, let's just keep playing hard, my yeah. AD should just fire me, like, <laughs> on the spot. I mean, you've got to give your guy something, you know, and, and so you change up what you're doing and – um you know, so I, I, I think that's the responsibility of everybody in game. You have so many different things that are going through your mind, but you've, you know, as, as energetic as I am on the outside, on the inside, um, I feel really at peace and really at ease, um, you know, with, with having to make adjustments during the course of a, of a 40 minute college game. Okay. Coach, how can, you know, 
if you're an assistant who wants to be a head coach, how can maybe you train yourself so you can, let's say, develop this eye of seeing everything where sometimes maybe assistant, you know, okay, I got to track this, 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 you know, is there any way maybe besides obviously being a head coach as an assistant, you can understand a flow of a game and be involved in everything? Well, I'll tell you this, Pat, uh, I would love to say, yeah, here's the answer. Yeah. But there's a there's a real reason um, why most of my career has been as a head coach, because uh, I can tell you, like when a CBA, the old Continental Basketball Association, we played 50 games and then we would have, you know, roughly 10 to 12 playoff games if, you know, if you were good in advancing. I went and then coached in a, in a league called the USBL which was the United States basketball league, which is a minor league in the summers. And I coached another 30 games there. So to me, the experience factor, like why did I want to coach the Venezuelan national team or the Dominican Republic? Cause I wanted head coaching experience. Yeah. And that by far is the number one way to learn. Now, if you're an assistant coach and that's just who you are and you don't have an opportunity to become a head coach, um, as stupid as this sounds coach at the youth, yeah. like the youth basketball camp. I know that sounds so weird and I'm going to give you guys a quick story and I hope it makes it into the segment. It doesn't get cut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the three years I'm not coaching, I go to one of my son's games, high school games. And I have a guy come up to me from the opposing team. His son's also playing. And the guy says, hey, will you start an AAU team? And I look at the guy like he's crazy. I just got done coaching the, you know, the, the, the Sacramento Kings. Why do I want to be an AAU coach? <laughs> right. Well, I see him a few weeks later. He begs me. So I said, hey, I'll tell you what. I'll go out to this outdoor court, Sycamore Park in Danville, California. I'll be there at 3 o'clock. If you want to gather some kids up, I'll put them through some workouts. So we do it for a couple of weeks. Then the guy asked me to enter the team into a tournament. I said, all right, I'll do it. So we ended up playing like, I don't know, 60 some games that summer. I'm coaching AAU basketball. I can tell you, this is the truth. The experience with those kids that they, and, and I did it for two years, actually, they were in seventh and eighth grade. All of the problems you have as a seventh and eighth grader coaching a seventh and eighth, you have the same problems at the pro level. They're just different. They're called different names. Instead of parents, they're called agents. <laughs> and so, but you're getting experience. It's the same thing like at, at Arkansas here, we're going to have a youth camp. Well, I think it's important for our GAs to be head coaches of this camp because they're, they're gaining experience. They yeah. got to call a timeout. And I know it sounds pretty elementary, but I can tell you, I learned so much coaching my son and his buddies in seventh and eighth grade. Um, Cause there's always, there's always these same set of problems, minutes, who gets the minutes, who gets the shots, what's the rotation, who's mad after the game, even when you win okay. all these things, it doesn't matter if it's third grade CYO, you're coaching an NBA team. Absolutely. Yeah. And, Go ahead, pal. Let you. Yeah. yeah, I shouldn't feel so bad then about putting running Panther Sports Camp on my resume. I guess anymore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I've won a lot of kids' camp championships, yeah, yeah. and I feel good about it. <laughs> well, I, I uh, will say, as an assistant coach, what you should do is every during the course of a game, you should be thinking and you should be writing yeah. down. You know, like if 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 we call a certain play and you think it didn't work, why didn't it work? Write it down, jot down the time, go back and watch it on film, bring it to the head coach. Um, those things are, and, and then certainly um, you, you should be putting your head coaching hat on with players all the time. Individually, yeah. what a player should, like, like your point guard, what is his picture that he's seeing on the floor? And are you sitting down with that player and painting that picture for him? You know, are you doing that? Yeah, everybody says it, but are you really doing it? Are you trying to get inside that player's head and seeing what he sees? Because everybody sees the game differently. And yeah. so as an assistant coach, you should be doing that. 
your power forward, when he's trailing on a break, what is he seeing? What is he feeling? What does he truly feel comfortable doing? What does he, what does he feel his options are that he's capable of doing? All those things assistant coaches should be doing, you know, with their players if they want to be a head coach. Everyone says they want to be a head coach, but what what are you bringing to the head coach that then he can bring to his athletic director and say, wow, this guy is really on top of his game. Keith Smart's been here for a few days. Today he came in my office and he talked about breathing. And he's doing a study on breathing when the ball is dead. Nobody's brought that to me before, but you know what? Like he's got me thinking, yeah. you know, and I said, Hey Keith, if you're studying it, when we get together, you know, in September, talk to the team, do a whole segment on breathing, you know, cause to me, it's, it's awesome. Like he's bringing something new to the table that I've never thought about. And I think that's what great assistants do. They bring new ideas, new thought processes, new philosophies to the head coach, to the team and individual players. Yeah. Coach, that was great, great stuff there. Uh, love that. Well, we we got a, we got a few more over unders for you. Yeah. We'll try to move faster, but that was an unbelievable segment. So thank you yeah. for that. I'm the one <laughs> holding up the over under, not you guys. No, no, no. <laughs> well, I mean, that's why we love over under. A question about your step count led to a Keith Smart yeah. story about breathing. That's why we love this segment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Coach. Uh, my over under um, the most realistic and successful rotation on your team over under seven and a half player rotation. I think it depends on your team. I really do. So okay. at, at Nevada, I played six and a half guys. Yeah. That was my rotation um, in the old G league. D league, whatever you want to call it, the CBA as a minor league coach, we had a 10 man roster. I played all 10 guys, 24 minutes in our 48 minute game. Cause I thought like everybody wanted to get called up. I understood the deal. Um, as, and my job was to, to develop players and win games and try to sell buildings out as a minor league coach. But I felt like obligated to play everybody as many minutes as I po- potentially could. And then that would obviously vary, um, you know, in the fourth quarter. Um, you know, last year at Arkansas, we had a little bit bigger rotation. We played about eight and a half. And this year we end up actually could play nine or 10. So I really think it depends, Pat, on your team. Okay. And I think it depends on the level too. Um, I, I, I'm very bothered by high school coaches, especially JV coaches that play five or six guys. Like, are you freaking kidding me? Your job is to develop players. The only way to develop is put them in the damn game. And so, um, High school coaches that are playing, you know, six guys, I, I don't really buy that. I think you need your, uh, uh, you know, your underclassmen kids to play a little bit. You know, um, one of the things that we brought, you know, in the NBA, Ty usually goes to the rookie unless you're a playoff team. So if you have a six year vet or you have a, a first round draft pick and it's a tie talent wise and impact the, the rookies winning. He was yeah. a first round draft pick. Then I get to college and I hear everybody say, well, Ty should go to the upperclassmen because he's been here for three years. <laughs> well, no, Ty should go to the younger player because he's going to be here for three more years. <laughs> right. And so, you know, at Nevada, everyone talks about our transfers, but at Nevada, Lindsey Drew and Cam Oliver, I made a decision that those two freshmen were going to play a lot of minutes in our first year so that it would help us in year two. And so I think your rotation, it really depends on who's on your roster. Um, I'm really comfortable playing six or seven guys because I think they can play through their mistakes. And I think that there's an incredible bond when you have a small rotation. And I've had this conversation with Tom Thibodeau because we've worked together. Um, Tom obviously has had a really small rotation throughout much of his career. Um, And we've talked about the benefits of that. Your guys become more durable. They become more tough. Um, They understand their roles explicitly. When you go, when you play more players, it becomes a little bit more convoluted and a little bit more complicated. Coach, looking at, you brought up an interesting point for me, looking at minutes you're giving players. Are you thinking, okay, 
when I sub one in, I got to give him this many minutes. So he comes into the game so he can have a chance to contribute. And the same thing that at the end of the game, it's like, okay, well, he only played nine minutes. Like do what can I realistically expect that he's going to give us? So we got to either get him maybe less minutes and go with someone else or give him more minutes so he can contribute. Yeah. So I, I mean, the word giving minutes, I yeah. think it's got to be out of, you know, it's kind of got to be out of a head coach's vocabulary. But I think if you clearly, like, I have no problem. We were talking about this the other night at dinner with our, with our staff. Um, I put a walk on in a game at Nevada named David Cunningham. He had not played the whole game. Uh, it was a really big game against Utah state. And one of the best players in the mountain West was a kid at the time or a player at the time named Sam Merrill. Mm -hmm. I put a walk on in at the end of the game. We needed one stop. There was a timeout and I put David Cunningham and I assigned him to guard Sam Merrill, maybe arguably the best player in the mountain West. And I put him in, I put a walk on in who maybe played 28 minutes the whole year for us. And I had him guard Sam Merrill because I thought that he could guard him do exactly what I wanted, send Sam Merrill in the direction I wanted him sent and do it without fouling. So I, and, and you know what? We had built David Cunningham up all year where he felt like he might have a role sometime during the course of the year that he would be a no foul, follow the game plan type player. So I think that you can build confidence up. You got to build confidence up in every single player whether they played the whole game or not, that you could put him in in the late game. Same thing with the guy. Somebody might be sitting there all game. We had another walk on Charlie Tooley that I put in the game late because he was a three point threat and he hadn't played the whole game. And so I think that you can do that stuff with guys. Um, yeah. And then I also think it puts a predicament on the off uh, on the opponent as well. Um, when they haven't seen a guy or don't have a real true feel for a player. Yeah. Yeah. Coach, uh, and sorry, I, I just have to ask follow up. We'll we'll keep moving quickly through this for you. But <laughs> when you have a tight rotation of seven, what are your conversations like with the eighth, ninth, tenth guy who they know they're close, but they're not really getting many minutes? And then also maybe the guys more at the end of the bench who have maybe no shot of getting in to keep them motivated and feeling like they're a part of the group and contributing. Yeah, Dan, that's an awesome question, and. So when we were doing the six and a half rotation uh, at Nevada, I had four sit outs for four straight years. So as I observed colleges, um, different programs, I often wondered why they had a ninth, 10th, 11th, 12th men, 13th sitting and doing nothing. And so I, I had a strategic plan that I wanted four guys sitting out every year. Cause I felt like eight guys was enough. I needed the other bodies for practice. Um, but I only needed really eight or nine guys for the games. Um, cause I knew that I could get by look in the NBA. You're used to playing 82 games. You're used to traveling. You're used to an eight minute longer game. I laughed at the stuff about you have to have depth. You don't have to have depth in college. I can promise you that. Uh, uh, does it help? Yeah, certainly it helps. Uh, but you also got to worry about your locker room. The more good players you have, the more dilemmas you have, the more egos you could have, the more chemistry, locker room interruptions you can have. And so I've always felt the worst thing to do is walk into a locker room after a win and guys aren't happy. That's that's the worst. Then you got to, you know, you got to go home. You got to turn on a West Coast game. You got to worry about this guy's not happy about his role. Um, so I think if you do have... Now there's no sit out guys this year in college basketball because of the new rules. A guy goes in the portal. He doesn't have to sit. So now this is going to be a problem for everybody in college basketball, this 13 man roster where everybody's eligible. And you're going to see more transfers because of this rule of no sit outs. So it's, been, it's the, the, the big picture. People don't talk about, well, now we're going to have even more transfers because your 12th and 13th guy are eligible in Instead of a sit out year. So how you manage that, it's going to be really, really complicated. Um, but the, the best way that I have found, and in the NBA, it's no differently because in the NBA, you do have 13, 14, 15. Now you have two-way players that come and go. And 
you've got to clearly define what's going on and you've got to tell guys, you know, uh, it's the same thing with the baseball team. Like sometimes a guy's going to hit against left-handed pitcher sometimes, but you got to let the player know so you don't catch him off guard. Yeah. Um, and so I think clear communication becomes extremely important when you're talking about rotation and bench players. It doesn't mean they're going to accept it, but certainly through clear and concise communications, the best way and uncomfortable conversations and having those conversations early, but probably the most important thing, the players know. So you've got to put them in competitive situations throughout your training camp or throughout your off season so that the players know, Yeah. Hey, this is the pecking order. This yeah. is our go-to player. Cause he's proven it. This is our ball security guy. Cause he's proven it. This, this is our six man. We all know it so that it's not coming from the coach. It's the players. Yeah. Um, it's, it's interesting. Cause you know, we, we had a change in our starting lineup and, pl- and a couple players came to me and said, coach, we all know like this dude's got to come in the starting lineup, man. Now's the time to make the move. And Interesting. the players know they understand better yeah. than, better than the coaches do. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, all right, coach. Uh, our last one here over under the number of paint touches you would like in an offensive possession, one and a half. Uh, I would say that for, I'd say over, uh, I would say paint touches are important for sure. Um, I, I think as, you, as the games evolve, the paint touches have come much more off the bounce than in the post. Um, yeah. But I do think throwing that thing in the post uh, is really, really important. I think it, the more paint touches you have, the more three balls you're going to get with open looks. That's for sure. That's the only question I'm going to answer really quickly and short and concise. <laughs> <laughs> well then i guess we can't but yeah we shouldn't ask follow-ups yeah, that, we, yeah that's our fault for all the follow-ups with you because i <laughs> well go ahead pat if you had a okay well yeah i guess you know earlier you talked about good to great so i guess with maybe one paint touch you feel like maybe there's fool's gold with the shot it can create and like you said that you know let's keep working let's get into that extra paint touch and then we're going to get the great shot no, we want to try to get as, as high a quality of shot as quick as we possibly can. Um, and I think you can do that best by, by beating the defense and getting shots up before the defense is actually set. Um, you know, for five, six years now, we've played at one of the faster paces in all of collegiate basketball. So, you know, I think, Pat, if you can get a quick early touch and transition, that's great. Mm-hmm. Uh, it might just be a quick kick ahead. You know, I think yeah. one of the worst things that can happen happen for a team offensively is 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 killing grass you know and so how do you get your guards and your outlet it could be a defensive rebounder get that ball up the floor and advancement as, as quick as possible and i sit, think in transition and in a half court if you can get a quick early paint touch and then a spit out it certainly can help you get a high quality shot even if it's off ball reversal okay okay well coach thanks for uh playing over or under with us that was, that was a lot of fun 